in the hall. Um, before I get into what we're doing here, uh, I just want to ask you how your week's been. It's been a little tension, a little tension the last couple of days I've, I've experienced with everybody. What's going on? Everyone okay? Everyone have a good week? Yeah? Yeah? You had a good week? That's awesome. Business is booming. Michael's assured of a raise, he said the other night on Tuesday. That's good, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he, trust me, Dan didn't say it. Michael did. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a little, dis I'm, a dis I'm disappointed in a couple of things. First of all, I'm disappointed that there's no one in the, in the Jesus, you know, fired up about Jesus couch. That kind of bums me out. I need somebody in there, you know what I'm saying? You have to be fired up about Jesus. The reason, like, if you, if, if you hear something, right, and you just get excited about it, you can just holler out, man. That's what that seat's for. That's the, that's the hot seat. So if you, if you feel like you want to just like, just rejoice a little bit, that's the seat for you, okay? I just want to let you know that. Now let me tell you about my week, just in case you have had a rough week. My week started with having to go buy a new Bible. Now that would seem to be a nice thing, right? But the reason why I had to buy a new Bible is because I'm going blind, I can't see, and I need one with bigger print. So that was awesome. That made me feel really young, right? And then, um, and then yesterday I got fitted for a denture. Okay, you see this? This is my, this is my redneck uh, Lake County. I'm Lake, Lake County preacher right now. I got a hole in my mouth. So I'm going to get a denture. Uh, so I've got, I'm going blind and I need dentures. So it's been a really great week for me. I hope that makes you feel better. Okay? All right, listen. This is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to spend the next four weeks in this series called We the People. It's going to be talking about us. And, and I want to share with you something that has been on my heart since I became a Christian. And as God began to, to just download things into my mind and into my heart, and I've been wanting to tell you what this stuff is for a long, long time. And I've, t I've, I've shared a little bit over the years with you, but I'm going to spend four weeks just dumping it on your lap so you can understand what it is you're part of. Okay, so when you come in here every single week, right, you come in, and it just it stands alone, I think. It's like, okay, here's the chairs. Here's the coffee, here's the building, here's Kyle, here's Jamie, they're up there doing their thing, we've got our stuff, there's the camera, and there's the, the film, and we've got the pictures, and it just kind of happens. Well, it doesn't stand alone. It's, a, it's, it's been a process of getting here, you know? 
And so we want to take some time to reflect on where we've been. We want to take some time to reflect on where we are and then on where we should go. Okay, so it's, it, there's more to this thing. This is a miracle, by the way, just in case you're wondering that we're even here. You know what I'm saying? We, 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 have, we have no uh, backing. No one said, hey, we want to branch off and start a church in Eustace. Here's a hundred grand. Go get a building and some sound equipment and get this thing going. It didn't work that way. We started with nothing. We started with nothing. I'm going to take you back down memory lane a little bit to tell you where we were, where we started from, so you can have an idea that it's more than just what you're sitting in here tonight, okay? It's more than that. Do we got people in the lounge? Are they in there? All right. Listen up now, okay? Listen. Hey, Wayne, did you see your picture up on the screen? You look pretty, didn't you? <laughs> All right, listen, this is, what, this is what's happened. Okay, way back when, let me take you back in time, none of you were there. The first people that I, from this church that, that, that started coming and, and doing this thing with me were, were Joseph and Mary, right? But they're not here tonight. But even they weren't there when I'm about to tell you. This was back in, I think, like 2006. I had a buddy of mine. He's the service manager at the Bill Bryan store up there in Fruitland Park, Dave Karnicki. He said, Moses, I want to start a men's Bible study, and I want to call it Know Your Role. And it was a precept study so we could figure out what a man's supposed to be, what he's supposed to do, a Christian man, right? So I was like, all right. He's like, I don't need you to, like, teach it or run it. I just want you to help me. And I feel like it should be in this area. And, hey, do you, do you know someone who, I heard you know the guy who owns the Omega Zone. Do you know who the Omega Zone was? Oh, you know, the, 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 the shopping plaza behind McDonald's and Racetrack here in 19, right? They just gave it a facelift. It's real pretty now, right? But it was, a, it was a junky old strip, and it used to be an old A&P. Y'all remember A&P grocery stores? And then there was a white rose. There's two massive units. There was white rose, A&P, and then a bunch of smaller units going down to the right there. Well, this guy owned it. His name was Stan. I didn't know him, but I knew someone who did. So I called the someone that I knew and said, hey, can you call this guy and ask him if we could do the, our, our prayer breakfast there? And he said yes. And so we started this prayer breakfast there. I don't know what time of the morning. It was real early. That's when I started to, to, to work a little bit with Kyle. Kyle was just a, a young, 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 young man. And I said, hey, we need some music. Could you think you could bring your guitar and, and play a song or two at like 5.30 in the morning with, with 10, 12 you know, 40, 50, 60 year old guys, that'll really, you know, be real. It was not Pentecostal at all. And so we, we just, but we did it. We had fun, right? And we did it. And uh, here's the thing um, there was a time that I had this vision, okay, that I would have a church in that place. I don't know what it was, but I felt like this is where we were going to have our church someday in that building. So we're doing this prayer breakfast thing, right? And this is what happens. Now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going around to some churches and I'm passing out flyers for this event that we were involved with. And I was sitting in my car at the Methodist church here in Eustace. I can remember it just like yesterday. And I was sitting in the car and I got a phone call from this guy, Stan, who owns the joint. And I don't really know the guy. Like, we're not buddies, you know what I'm saying? But he calls me and he says, got a minute? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we start talking. He's like, you know, when I, when I, when I built that place, I really thought that it would be like a church. I built it to look like a church. It used to be, see, when you walk in, there was, a, there was a skateboard park, and I noticed that there were kids skating on it. But what I didn't notice all those mornings that I was there is that it, it's a stage, and, and I didn't even bother to look up to see the lighting, you know, like these can lights. But they had a bunch of them on a rack with colors. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And they had a sound system. I didn't even pick up on it. We were just there doing our breakfast thing, right, eating some eggs, bacon. And so he's like, you know, I just, when I built it, I just thought that with all these churches that, that pop up all over town, that someone would use our place, my place, to start a church. I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, would you start one? I said, Excuse me? He goes, yeah, well, you start a church there. And I was like freaked out of my mind. I'm like, you, and I told him, like, you have no idea what you just told me. I, I, I had a vision that there was going to be. A I didn't even know this guy. And I thought, yeah, 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 yeah let's do this. But then I, I, I toned it down. You know, I was like, all right, I did, I did the Christian thing. Let me pray about it. Yes, no, but I, I said, no, let me go home and hit my knees 
and ask the Lord, if this is really you, do you really want me to do this? Because it sounds great, but do you really want me to do this? So I, I, I called them back, I don't know, it was maybe a week later, and I said, yeah, 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 I think we should do that. When do you want to start? He says, I don't know, about two weeks. Now, wait a minute now. I've been doing this now for a while. This doesn't just happen, right? You don't just sprinkle fairy dust and all of a sudden these guys show up on the stage and they just know music. Like, you got to do some stuff. Every time you go to the bathroom and there's toilet paper, someone put it there, right? The floor is swept. The music is prepared. Someone's teaching the kids. They're decorating. There's all kinds of stuff that you got to do. You need people. Like, I didn't grow up in church, but you know you need some people to do some things, right? You need some people. But he says, I said, well, you're crazy. We can't do that in two weeks. You can't start right away. He goes, why not? We have a purpose. We have a place. And we have a pulse. Let's do this. Kids are dying and going to hell. We're going to do this. With or without you. I'm like, all right, fine. I'll do this. It's pretty amazing. Guy got up the first week. I have the worship. This was the worship folder. I still have it. I found it. This was the worship folder. They'll just tell you how ghetto the whole thing was. This was the worship folder that they handed out to everybody. Full color. It was just beautiful, wasn't it? Guy gets up, Stan, right? Bald dude. Wasn't as pretty as you. Wasn't as pretty as Dwayne, but he was bald. And he got up, he said, this was his message. You all suck, and Jesus isn't. Don't be the world's bitch. That was his message. And I'm going, and my name was on this thing. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. But that's what, that was his message. That was his message. But you gotta understand something. Here's this place. I don't remember the exact square footage, but it was like 42 or 44,000 square feet. Just to give you an idea, you might know how many square feet your house is. But this building right here, this is just shy of 5,000 square feet. It's a pretty big joint, right? 40,000 plus, 40,000 square feet of Christian dreaming. That's what it was to me. I was in there and I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Now see, the thing is, I had been to a couple churches since I had gotten saved. And there were good churches. And there were good pastors. And there was a good message. And there was some, you know, decent music. And the decor was nice. And it was good, but I always sensed that there was something lacking there. It was good, but I never felt like it was great, but it was good. It was good. So we had this first service, and I got to share with them. If you notice on this piece of paper, I highlighted it, that at 1123, that was my shot. It was my shot to do what it said. This was back in 2006, and that was to tell his dream. So in 2006, I stood before some people, and I shared with them Kind of what I'm going to share with you tonight. But I don't think they were ready for it. I don't even know if you're ready for it or not. But here it comes. Here it comes. Y'all ready? Okay, you need to buckle up. So here we are in this 40,000 square foot spot in a place where there was room to dream of what could be. I had been to church and I'd listened to some good preaching. I heard some good songs, but I always knew there was something missing. I always thought it could be something more. And so I got into this place, and inside the place there was batting cages and putt-putt golf and jump houses, and there was a, a wrestling ring, and there was a computer bank, and they taught pottery, and there was a skateboard park, and there was a bike ramp, and there was, uh, there was, there was um, dodgeball, and I don't, they had weight training. They had just everything. They had people bringing their kids in for birthday parties, and they had food, and they had music playing, and you see people just you know, bringing their kids, and they would just be in there reading, whether it was a Bible or not. Didn't matter. They were just reading. There was just enjoyment there was interaction there was life being lived around this place it was really a neat place and then of course we start our church and we added that element to it as well with praying and preaching and and all that kind of stuff but that just kind of scratched the surface but it was good it was good but even that which I felt just scratched the surface was much more than anything you really see and what I'm going to share with you over the next four weeks it might be new to you but it's not new. What I'm about to share with you is not something that I saw somewhere else and I stole the idea and said, hey, we're gonna do it here. This is stuff that just God has been sharing with me for years and I love you, my family, I wanna share it with you, but it's not unique. It's being done, it's just not being done here. 
So I want you to dream bigger. I want you to dream bigger. See, most often churches, and I'm going to include ourselves in that too, because we haven't graduated yet either by any means. Churches are often in America, 75 people or less. They're down side streets. And I'm not talking about church, the body of believers. I'm talking about churches. Okay, down side streets. No one knows they're there, and they just come, and they, they, they pray, and they preach, and they sing, and then they just kind of go home. And they, what they do is they, they stand before you, and they tell you how you should live life. See, it was different here as it was in the Omega Zone. This is, let me tell you what happened in the Omega Zone when we had church. I would stand up and I would share the scriptures with people how Jesus came to give abundant life and this is how you should do it and this is how you should do it. And what would happen is after the service was over, the place, the guy who owned it, he left it open. His gift to that ministry was that he wouldn't charge anyone who came to church for the next two and a half hours after the service was over, you could go and you could play there. And so what would happen is after we got done, no one left, much like y'all here, but instead of just sitting around, hanging out, socializing, which is good, which is very, very good, it was amazing. You see moms and dads over on the video game machine where they did the, the let's dance thing, and mom and dad are dancing with their kids. And, and here's the kid with his skateboard, and he's, hey, dad, just check this out, check this out. And there's dad cheering them on. You know, and they were playing putt-putt golf, and they were in the batting cages. It was awesome, right? We had a chiropractor there. He was giving adjustments for free. I had this lady, her name, I, I, it's been a long time. Her name was Mary. She was supposed to come and start giving massages for everyone. It was all for free. It was a holistic approach to ministry. It was for the whole body, mind, soul, spirit, physical, everything. And people would just hang out. You'd teach them how to live a different way, and then they'd live it out right there. It was kind of awesome, like no one would leave. And we had food, and we had fun, and they were living out what they were taught. It was a wonderful situation. But here in churches, the normal church model, just the normal church model is pray, preach, sing, and then send them out there hoping, which is crazy, hoping that they're gonna find the abundant life that Jesus said he came to provide in a culture that is hell-bent on your destruction. Send them out on their own. Have a nice day. It's been great seeing you here this week. See you next weekend. And that's what churches do. We're, we're guilty of it too. I'm not saying we're like the best church in the world either. We're awesome. Amen. But we have room for improvement, right? We have room for improvement. So let me ask you this. Here's a question for you. How many people in this room have been to heaven and come back? No. Never happened, okay? You, never, you weren't there. We, hear in the, we see in the scriptures that there's streets of gold and there's this and that, right? Okay, I don't know how it's all going to work out. I don't. Christians argue about that all the time, what it's going to look like in heaven. But let me ask you a question, show of hands. Who in this church thinks that no matter what happens in heaven, whether it's here on earth or if it's some place up there, whatever, who thinks it's going to be amazing? Raise your hand. It's going to be amazing. So we all agree it's going to be super, right? It's going to be super. Now, Jesus said that he came to, to give an abundant life or life to the full, right? You know that that's what it says in John 10.10. 10. Now, we know that heaven's going to be amazing, right? And, and he came to give us an abundant life. Well, let me ask you this. Do you know the Lord's Prayer? Hallow, you know, our Father art in heaven. I don't know who this art is. He's going to be there when we get there. But, but, but you know, what, what does he go on to say? He says, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So we know it's going to be amazing in heaven. What about right here and right now? Is, what about an abundant life right now? How about an awesome life right now? Or, or just, I'm just wondering, is it supposed to be 70 or 80 years of hell and then it gets good? Because that's the, that's the mindset of a lot of people. They were just kind of just going through the most and just try to get through this hell hole and then someday it's going to be awesome when we get to heaven. Is that the way it's supposed to be? See, I don't think so. Is it supposed to be 70, 80 years of, of just the Christian believers just blending into everything else that everyone else does and then someday it's going to be good when you die? Come on. Is that the way it's supposed to be? I don't think so. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans 12 too, to not copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but be a new person. Be transformed. Change the way you think. 
It's not supposed to be just mediocre, ho-hum, just get through this hellhole, and then someday it's going to be awesome when we, go, when we actually die and go to heaven. It's not supposed to be that way. He said, let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Can someone say amen? Please, come on. It's supposed to be good. It's supposed to be good, right? So, instead of sending people out on your own, go find your way in a culture that's hell-bent on destroying you. And and let me remind you of this little culture here, this culture that you're immersed in, this culture that you're in every single day. It kind of dictates the way you live your life. It's a big monster, isn't it? And when I say culture, I want you to understand what I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about the the, the whole of the United States of America, where we live, the way this place operates, the customs, standards, traditions, beliefs, It's the way that we live our lives. And I'm not talking about just your worldview. I'm talking about things like this, like the education system, our teaching philosophies. I got a long list. Transportation, entertainment, finances, sports, healthcare, politics, the way we dress, our worldview, of course, art in its various forms, painting, sculpting, dance, music, poetry, culinary, agriculture. Law enforcement, the internet, government, radio, business, everything. It's our world that we live in, and it's a big, fat monster, and it dictates the way that we live our life. And somehow the church is saying, hey, this is the way you should do it. Now go out into that sewer and find the abundant life on your own. How's that going to work? Not so well. Not so well. This world system that you live in All this stuff that the world system created and is continuing to spit out. It's outside of the faith in Christ. It's not designed from the gospel. That the the driving force behind this stuff that you live in is not the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? It's not. You know what it's driven by? Greed, fear. Profit. Listen, when you go, who likes the Olive Garden? I'm just picking on them. Who likes the Olive Garden? Anybody? When you go to the Olive Garden, here's a couple right here. Okay, Mike and Marsha. You go to the Olive Garden, you like it. It's yummy, right? So you're going to have a good time, hopefully. Food's good, you're going to eat it, right? Here's here's the thing. The byproduct of the Olive Garden is they're going to have a nice night together. But that's not the reason why it exists. The Olive Garden doesn't exist to exalt Jesus the King. The, The Olive Garden exists, why? It starts with a P. Prophet. That's the reason that exists. But see, the scripture says that all things were made by him and for his glory. The Olive Garden is not for his glory. It's for the glory of the owner. It's for the glory of the company to make more money. That's what drives it. That's why it exists. These businesses out here and everything that we live in, they're not made to exalt the living king. They're not. They're driven by things that are not the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're in a, we're in a culture that's, that talks about have it your way. You know, um, watch out for number one. Self-indulge, self-indulge. Build your career. Use people to gain more money instead of gaining, using your money to, to bless and help more people. That's the way it should be, but it's not the way it's taught. Do, here's a good one. Do it yourself. Anyone think do it yourself is good? DIY. Popular now, right? Do-it-yourself projects? You guys are not awake tonight. What's up? I'm excited. Yeah, but I need you guys to be along with me. We're going to take a journey together. It's going to be bumpy, but we need some energy in this room. Anyone have any energy? Come on now, seriously? I can tell. Wayne, I need to hear you holler. Sleeping. DIY, do it yourself. Sounds good, right? Save money, do a project at home. You know what the problem is with it? The Bible. You know the Bible says we should share each other's burdens. The Bible says we should help widows and orphans. The Bible says we should help each other. Not do it yourself. Sounds good. Saves money. But you start pouring that into people's heads. You're teaching them wrong. You're not supposed to do it yourself. No one in the Christian body should do it themselves. No one. You start promoting that that mindset, it's like cancer. We need to be aware of that. Here's another one that the country says. 
buy what you want, self-indulge, and listen, if you can't afford it, just charge it. Sounds good, doesn't it? Been there, done that, anybody? Anyone paying for that dearly right now? They feel like they're in jail? Yeah. So you don't own that stuff. That stuff, what? Owns you. And that's the culture that we live in. It's here to destroy you. It's here to destroy you. Okay, that's the culture that you live in. What I don't see personally are Christians, and I'm stealing this from our our 33 series, I don't see Christians creating and cultivating the dominant culture. That's not what I see. I don't see that. What I see are Christians that compete in like manner to non-Christians in the same secular arena searching for the same goals. That's what we're doing. Instead of creating something new that's saturated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we do is we're just sheep. And we're just content to follow the current social norms. And then we gather in church, pray, preach, and go home. And those that are radical Christians, they go to Bible study on Wednesday. Woo! Please. Maybe a life group on Tuesday as well. Those are the radicals. The world thinks that the crazy ones are the ones who go to church twice in a week. Has anyone in this house ever read the book of Acts? How often did they go to church? Every day. How many people got added to the, to the group? Thousands. Y'all look smart to me. I think that maybe the way we do it ain't right. I don't know. I'm thinking maybe we could do it God's way. Now, here's the thing. Now, listen, I understand that this number about to throw out to you is just wacky and not accurate. But you all know that supposedly about 70% of our country claims to be Christians. Now, I'm not here to tell you who's a Christian and who's a not. Who's not? Who's a not? I got stuck in my, I was spitting a seed. Okay, I don't know who's a Christian and who's not. Only God knows who a Christian is. My heart is deceitful and wicked, and Paul even said I, I, don't, I could deceive myself. So I don't even know. I hope I am. I love Jesus. I do, I do, I do, and I'm, I'm working on that. I'm working on it, really. So he's working with me. I'm working with him. We're getting there. But 70% of our country here claims Christianity. So if, if that's the case, how can a, a, a culture that has 70% Christians be so secular? How? Nobody really has an answer. It's a big answer. We couldn't, you know, we couldn't figure it out in one line. How do 70% of us claim that we're Christians, but yet we live in a country that you're hard-pressed to sniff out some genuine Christianity? Why is that? Here's just my answer. You can make up your own answer, but my answer is because all that we are falls miserably short of what we should be. That's what. That's why I think this country is so secular. See, we gather, we pray, and we preach, and we sing, we take an offering, we take communion, we go home. Can't wait to see you next week. Hope to see you Tuesday night. That's all fine and good. We're not getting it done. Because all that we are, I'm talking about the ones that, out of that 70%, the ones that really are Christians. I'm not, I mean, there are some in that group that are real Christians. I know that. But we're not all that we could be. As a body of believers, as the church, as the body of Christ, we are not all that we could be. That's why I think the country is so, so secular. Let me tell you something. You can't be the tail and think you're going to wag the massive dog. It just doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way. And that's what the church is. The church, we're, we're just this little group of people that would like the, this different thing. We would like to see some change. We'd like to see some large-scale change in our community and, and, and in our world. But, but we're not all that we should be. We're not all that we, that we should be. Listen, the, the culture that we live in, if, you, if we could say this, it's the way we do life. Would you agree? The, the, the American culture, just the way we do life, all of our traditions and customs and our practices, just the way we do things, right? 
Well, you know what? We need, we need, to, we need a new way. You know, we call this thing now Christianity. You know what they called it in the Bible three times? Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 24. You know what Christianity's called? The way. It's called the way. That's what they referred to it as. It was a new way of living. It wasn't just, just be the same as everybody else in the same arena doing the same things and just hoping that it's going to get better. No, you need a new way of life a new way of thinking, a new set of priorities, a new culture. And I don't want to be that church down a side street just hoping things are going to get better. I don't want, some are content to sleep. I'm not content to sleep. And I hope Revolution Church is not content to sleep. I really do. I want to be part of something different. The the reason for our name is the definition of it. Revolution means a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. That means like Jesus. I look at all this and I go, this isn't right. We need to change everything. And to be a little church down a side road, pray, preach, sing, go home, and think that that's going to shift the status quo is craziness. It's madness. It's not going to happen. We have to be all that we could be for this to happen. You know, the world teaches us that your pursuit is the main pursuit. You know, like, let's just be honest. Most of our time, if you you would be honest with yourselves and with everyone else, most of your time is spent, like, working and taking care of yourself and maybe your spouse and maybe your kids. And if you're really generous and kind, maybe a few more people within your circle. And sometimes we reach way out and help someone that we don't even know. But generally speaking, would you agree that most people in our country spend most of their time providing and protecting and and doing all that for themselves? That's what we do. We've got a mortgage to pay. We've got our own spouse. We've got our own hobbies. We've got our own time. We've got our own stuff we've got to buy. It's us, us, us. And if you're super generous, you'll give a little bit. Okay, and I appreciate those things. And I think God appreciates those things. But listen, we need a momentous shift in the status quo. I'm talking about instead of making your thing the main thing, how about pursuing God's purposes and advancing his kingdom? What about those became your main pursuit? Here's a crazy question for you. And I'm not saying I've graduated either, but let me just throw this out to you. My wife and I were walking around today in the metropolis of Howie. We stopped to get a cup of coffee, and we saw this little... There's like a strip of stores right in Howie, and the last spot was this little church conference room. They don't worship there. It's the church. It said offices and conference room of Lake Hills Community Church that worships in Leesburg. But they have a little office space there. And all the blinds are closed. That's going to help. But there was a little spot. I could see through the blind, and I looked in. And it was all the crappy old furniture that nobody wants. I mean, we all agree that's the the status quo. When you're done with your furniture, when it's real crappy and you don't want it anymore, what do you do? Call Moses. Maybe they need a couch. Maybe they need some chair. I mean, we can joke, but isn't that usually the status quo? Right? How about this? And I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know if anyone would ever take me up on this. And I'm not asking for anything because we're good. But what about this? You know, when you need a couch... You go buy one, and then you bring the crappy couch to the church, and you throw God your crap, right? Okay, how about this? Who, who does this? Hey, you know what? We got some extra. Why don't we buy, why don't we buy the church uh, or someone else a new couch, and we'll take their crap? That, like, that's insanity, right? That's insanity. Who does this? Does anyone do this? No. But why not? Because it's all about ourselves. We, we buy ourselves the nice stuff and we throw God the crap. I mean, just be, I've done it. So like, I'm, not, I'm not accusing you of nothing that I haven't done. I've, I've done the same thing. I bring my crap here too. This place is filled with my crap. Try using that computer to give. It crashes. <laughs> junk, junk, right? I do it. But how about a mindset change, a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo? We don't throw God our crap, we throw God our best. Doesn't that what the Bible says we're supposed to do? I think, right? Yeah, it does. So how about if we do that? If God is making his plea 
through the church. If he's making his plea through us, we're the body, we're the church. If he's making his plea to those that are not here, through us, that's what the scriptures tell us. And if his presence is manifest most powerfully and clearly through the church, well then the church needs a revolution. It does. Look around you tonight. Look around. Seriously, don't look at me anymore. Look around you. Seriously, look around you. Looking around, right? Beautiful people that you love. Now compare it to God's sunset that when you see it on the side of the road, you stop and go, wow. Awesome, right? You guys drive down Lakeshore Drive, five, six o'clock, it's insane, and we go, wow. Do you know that that's not the greatest manifest presence of God on this earth? It's us. When people see the church, they should go, wow, that's beautiful. We need a new way of life. We need to be totally different than the common practices that are out there now. The, the, the social norms that you just suck in and just accept and live by and hope that it's gonna get better and maybe someday when I die, it's gonna get better. It should be beautiful. You know, the church just can't be a place where you come and learn about God. So that's what it is, most often. Churches, no matter what we do, it seems as though it's, dis it's just another disguise for a Bible study. Whether we call it a, a Bible study or whether we call it a gathering like this, what are we doing right now? We're going to share, in a minute, I'm going to start downloading God's Word to you. We're studying the Bible. We go to men's group, what do we do? We go to ladies' group, what do we do? We have youth groups, what do we do? What do we do, what do we do, what do we do? We study the Bible. That's what the church is. No wonder why nobody wants to come. Because that's where we are. We're a place to go study the Bible. I don't need to go to a place to study the Bible. I have a Bible at home that I haven't read in 30 years. I could do the same thing there. Why would I drive and spend money to go do something I don't want to do at home? That's so easy. It's right on my nightstand. It's been there since I was 10. And I still haven't picked it up. The church can't be just a place to learn about God. We need to be a people that live like God. Amen. That's what it needs to That's what the world needs to see. So let me, let's, do a, let, let's go into this new, nice new, this is my new sword, and I'm going to stain it with Satan's blood. Okay, listen, go, go do me a favor. This is a real easy one. Genesis chapter 1. It's on page 1. You could find it, right? This is so easy. Genesis chapter 1, right? Verse 26 through 28. We need to be a church that doesn't just learn about God. We need to be a people that live like him. Look here in verse 26. Then God said, let us make human beings, man, woman, in our image to be like us. We're supposed to be like God. Not just learn who he is, live like him. Let's read on. It says, to be like us, they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. Do we even know what that means completely in its entirety? No, but would you say it's good? He said, yeah, this is good. I'm pouring good stuff into you, right? And he gives us a hint of what this blessing might be. He, he says, uh, he blessed them. It says, be fruitful and multiply. That's a blessing, amen? Okay, <laughs> fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food, and I have given every green plant its food for all the wild animals, the birds, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And that is what happened. God looked over all he had made. This is very good. So here's what I'm saying. We can't just be a church that, that learns about God. We need to be a church, a group of people that live like God, right? Not just uh, know about him, but to be like him, creative. We need to be creative. We need to enjoy all the earth. This is what happened. He said, here's, here, here people, I create you, and I give you husband and wife. You guys get to have sex together. It's awesome, amen? 
right? Be fruitful and multiply. And here's all this food, and here's beautiful sunsets and trees and animals, and you get this amazing vacation resort, and it's all for free. And you get all this, and you get to run it. You're the boss of it. It's amazing. So I want you to be like me. I want you to create stuff. I want you to beautify stuff. I don't want you to just look at that right now, okay, and say, when I read that, what that means to me in my translation is on Saturday night at 6, we get together, we sing, we preach, we pray and go home. I don't see that here. That to me is not a people that live like God. And that's what the world needs. A new way that is more beautiful than what is being lived right now. Finally. You're awake. Woo! I almost stroked out to get you there. <laughs> awesome. Listen. Not only does he give all this beauty for us to enjoy, but he gives us personally gifts and talents to be used to bring more beauty into the world and more glory to him. Now listen, loved ones, dream. Now is the time when you start dreaming, okay? Your own dream. Dream about what could be. Dream about something that's bigger than what already is in your own life and in your church and in your community and in your world. Dream about changing the world. Dream about a culture that's, that's made and driven by the gospel of Jesus Christ, not by profit and greed and fear. That's what we need to start dreaming about. Dream about heaven on earth. Dream about his will here on earth as it is in heaven, but not just someday, right now, right now, on your watch. Not on your kids, but right now. Start believing Start believing that God can do something tremendous through you right here, this group of people. And listen, it's not because, you know, Sandra, you're just, you're great at doing nails. It's not going to get it done. You know, Kelly, he fixed my car. That's not going to do it. Talent. But it's not going to do it. It's not because we're super awesome. You know, Kyle's a pretty smart guy. He could probably come up with a plan on how to get some people in here. Tanya's got a PhD. She's wicked smart. She could probably get some people in here too. We got some wicked smart people in here. That's not going to get it done. That's not going to get it done. Let me tell you what's going to get it done. We got to believe that God can do something, right? We got to believe that God can do something. Listen, Ephesians 4.16, go there, please. Ephesians 4.16. Two verses right here, one and four, one and three, so keep your finger there. Ephesians 4.16, this is what it says. He, that's God, right? Christ, the head of the body, the church, that's us. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. See, it, it, see it's not something that, that you can do on your own, in your own power. Hey, look at me. I can do this. I'm smart enough. I can come together with a, a good business plan to make all this work. Creative marketing. That's not going to work. But God puts together the body perfectly. And as much as uh, I get frustrated, I believe the scriptures, I believe God, and I believe that this family's been put together just right for a time such as this to do great things with God. I believe it. Now look, look in Ephesians 3.20. While you're still there, I told you to hold the page and I dumped mine. 3.20. It's not about you doing something. Listen to what God wants to do. Now all glory to God who is able, say who is able, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Like, so if for, the, for those of you who have like a really small thinking that God couldn't really do much, he could do way more than that. For crazy people like me who have a big vision, he could do way more than that. Infinitely more than I could ask or think. Let me ask you a question. Listen. Who here 
If you won the, the Powerball, like 50, 60, 100 million dollars, right? 100 million dollars. Who thinks that you could do great things for the Lord if you had 100 million dollars? Raise your hand. Come on. Seriously. Right? Well, guess what? The scriptures say, and that means it's true, amen, that God has glorious, unlimited resources. He's got hundreds of billions. Of, he could do whatever he wants, and his power at work in you could do more, infinitely more. Say infinitely more. Infinitely more than you could ask or think. He can get this done through us, and he put us together just right. This is just right. We don't lack. We have within this family the resources, praise God, to make an impact on this world and change the culture that we live in. We can. We can. I think the days of simply coming to church are over. I don't want to just have you come to church anymore. It's got to be more than that. I'm going to download for, for the next three weeks in greater detail what that might look like. But I think the days of just coming to church are over. Preach, pray, sing, go home. Preach, pray, sing, go home. I'm so bored. It's got to be more than that. God is so beautiful. If you stepped out into nature, right, you see it. The fall. Who's ever gone to New England in the fall? Oh, right, it's crazy. I know better than to ask you. You just got on a plane for the first time last year. That's crazy. The depth and the angles and the contrast and the shadows and just such amazing beauty of who God, and that's just the tip of his creation. That's nothing. And so the church needs to display that same variety and beauty and depth, a new way to live, a new way to live. I think the days of just coming and, and just experiencing and going home, they're over. They're over for this church. They're over. I think the days of, of coming are over, and I think the days of dreaming of what could be and beginning to live it right now have to prevail. I think that's what has to happen here. We need to dream of what God could do through us. He placed us together perfectly to accomplish his purposes here in this community. We lack nothing because we have at our, at our disposal God's glorious riches. His unlimited resources the one who spoke and the planets came out of his mouth. This is the one who gives you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. We need to change our attitude here. We can't just be a church where you come and hang out and listen to some nut job yell at you for an hour. It has to be more than that, right? That's why we have Kelly preach, because he's nice. Have you guys noticed that he's up to an hour now too? I love it. Yes. Anyone have a pen? If you take notes, write this down. Revolution Church is a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. Revolution Church is a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. That's who we are. And that's who we will be. Why? What's the most famous verse in Scripture? John 3.16. Let me tell you why Revolution Church is a gospel-centered, culture-creating community, bringing beauty to the world. You know, we hear John 3.16 over and over and over and over and over again. You hear it a thousand times, almost to the point when someone starts saying it, you don't even hear it anymore. But stop. Stop that and listen. Close your eyes and listen to these. Listen to these words. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's why we're a gospel-centered community. Because if we're to be like God, what did God do? God loved his people so much. Here's the gospel. You didn't earn it. You didn't want it. You didn't deserve it. But because of his love for who? Everyone. Because of his love for everyone, he gave life. He gave his own life so you could have life. And so that's what we are. That's the church. That's the reason why this church exists. That's, why, that's the only reason why any Bible-believing Christian church, followers of the way, exists because of that. Be, not because you earn it, not because you deserve it, but because God loves you so much that he gave his life for you so you could live. That's who we are. And so every single thing that we do, everything that we say should come from that. We don't deserve anything, but God gave his very best. You want to talk about bringing beauty to a world? He brought Jesus to the world, right? So that's the way we're supposed to be. Everything we do is not because they deserve it or they even ask for it. It's because we love them so much that we bring beauty to the world for them. Every single thing is about that. That's who we are. That's who we are. Listen. We have to respond and respond well to the call of John 3.16. Don't just memorize it. He didn't say, go teach them to memorize all that I have taught you. He said, go teach them to obey. That means do everything that I taught you. So we need to respond and we need to respond well. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's your response. It's biblical. This is what we're supposed to do. Don't make something up. It's all in here. Put your eyes on God's word. Don't take me at what I say. Make sure it's biblical. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Tell me when you're there. I was hoping for more time than that. I needed some coffee. Okay, you ready? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Either way, Christ's love, depending on your translation, it'll either say controls us or compels us, gives us the motivation. Either way, no matter what, Christ's love compels us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, and we know that because it says in, in, in John 3, 16, right? He came for all, 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 all. So we believe that? Do you guys all agree? Do you believe that? Okay, we gotta, we got to build on things here, okay? we got to believe that. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. Now listen, if you believe that Christ died for all, because it's biblical, it says it, right? Then you got to believe the next thing. You can't pick and choose. There's no such thing as a Bible buffet, y'all. You, got, you cannot pick and choose. You, you agreed that Christ died for all, right? So then the next one, the next part is this. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. The life that the culture teaches. Your purpose is the main purpose. Take care of me. Don't worry about everyone else. Bring God the scraps. Take care of your own stuff. That's not the way we're supposed to live anymore. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life, now stop, I'm going to ask you a question, put you on the spot, who received his new life? Come on now. Who received it? Who received it? Did you receive his new life? You're saved? Okay. You can raise your hand then. It's okay. He died for everyone, right? For everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them and for them. So if you believe that Jesus died for all people, which you all said you did, then you also know that you are to die to yourself for all people. We cannot live for ourselves 
anymore. Our motivation, the, co- the thing that compels us is this love of Christ that he had for us. No longer is it going to be me-centered, my gain, my fame, my fortune, my stuff, my time. The response, the only response to Christ's love is thankful humility. Others before me, first God, then other people, then me. And love is active. Love is not, I love you. Love is active. And you see it displayed in the scriptures. Christ died to show his love for all people. So we die to our old life to show love to other people. The Great Commission, what does it say? Just say, tell everyone you love them? No, he says, go bring beauty to the world. Go bring my son to the world. Show him what he did for you and teach him to do the same thing. Go, go, go. Teach them to obey all that I have commanded. Did you guys ever do show and tell in in school? Whoever did show and tell? It was fun, right? See, people think that you're supposed to just live out the Christian life before people. And some people say, no, you just got to tell them. I beg to differ. I think it's both, right? Christianity is show and tell. You show them, and then you tell them, right? That's all it is. You show them a new way of life. Show them something different. Go show and tell a new way to think and live that's more beautiful than the common practice. That's what they need. Don't go up to them and say, hey, you're a stinking sinner. Stop. Repent or you're going to hell. Show them something more beautiful. Show them a new way of life. Everything we are, everything we do, gospel-centered, everything has to keep coming back and back and back to this reality that we deserve nothing, we earn nothing, but God's love is so massive and unstoppable that he loves you so much that he gives and gives and gives. Everything we do and everything that we are moving forward has to come from that, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And look, it's not, this church is not for our benefit. You know, for those of you who have been here most every week, we've been studying the book of Romans. And Paul describes really in detail the gospel. But you see at the beginning, Romans 1, 5, and in the very end, Romans 16, 26, and 27, he says the same thing. He starts it with this, he ends it with this. That this gospel, it's that you might obey and believe. Why? All glory to God. The gospel is for him. It's for him. It's for him. The growing population is a king's glory. So when we bring beauty to the world, it's not so we could get praised. It's not so revolution can be praised. It's so that the Lord can be praised. That's what we do. We have to have a mindset change. We have to have a priority change. The main purpose of our life is to advance God's kingdom, not to advance our own lives. Paul says this in Romans 12, 1. He says to give your body completely to this. Give your life completely. Like, that's a high watermark, right? Nobody in here, including this man who stands before you, has ever given 100% to the Lord. I haven't. I haven't. But that's what God says to do. It's not a suggestion. It's not a maybe. It's not a, hey, if you're not too busy this week, Could you give me a little more time? It's give your life to me. Some translations will even go on to say, I love that. It says, for all that I have done for you, this is your reasonable worship. Reasonable. Could be better. It could be more than everything. But I'll settle for just everything. Give me that. Give your body completely to kingdom advancement in response to all that he has done. And you know what? We don't have to wing it. God is so good. Can you say God is good? God is so good. He gives us an example of this. So we don't have to make up anything. We don't have to create something on our own. We don't have to guess, what does a church look like that goes all in? What's a church look like that's so beautiful? What's a church look like that's giving themselves completely to the work of the gospel? Who don't care about their own lives? Who literally do what 2 Corinthians 5 said. They no longer live their own lives anymore. They live for him, completely in, giving their whole life to him. What's that look like? You don't have to guess. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. Can we read it for the unmillionth time? 
I never get tired of hearing this. And I hope you never do too. It's the most beautiful thing. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. You there? All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to sharing in meals, including communion, the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now jump over. Jump over to chapter 4, verse 32. Same group of people. Jesus has just gone, gone to the cross. He's come back. He's, he's back. He's started the church. They're all meeting together. They're praying together. They're worshiping together. They're selling off their own stuff. And this is what it says. This is their response. This is what it looks like to go all in. All the believers, not just some, not just you, but not you. All the believers. That means all of us, right? All the believers were united in heart and mind. In other words, they had one thing on their mind and it wasn't themselves. They had one thing in mind. Jesus Christ had told them how it was going to go down. It went down exactly the way he said it was going to go down. And then he shows up and walks through a wall and says, this is what I think y'all should do. And they're like, yeah, I think that we should do that. He just walked through a wall. He just raised himself from the dead. I think, he's a, I think that we should listen to him. I think he's a valuable source. He's reliable. We should listen. And so what do they respond? All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. They didn't bring God the crap. They sold their houses. They sold their possessions and gave their stuff away because they didn't care about themselves anymore. That's all they cared about was like, oh my goodness, this Jesus is real. Look what he did. Look what he said to do. I'm all in. I don't even need this stuff anymore. This stuff means nothing to me. You want my car? Take it. Jesus, 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 precious Jesus. That's all they cared about. They don't care about their stuff. It's a totally different way to live. But they did it, and it was absolutely beautiful. And it was bold. And they didn't hide underneath a basket down some side street somewhere. They were bold. They were united. They were living on purpose. Do you understand what I mean by that? Their purpose was God's purpose. Advancing the kingdom of God was the reason they woke up in the morning. To do this thing, to give glory to God, to spread the kingdom, to testify powerfully of the risen Christ. Christ rose boldly, boldly. Daily meeting, praying, giving, radical hospitality, sharing, studying, enjoying, community, building, common goals, helping each other. No DIY. You know, it's tough to shove a religion down somebody's throat. But it's so easy to serve them up something that's yummy. Would you agree? Come on. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to serve them up something yummy. Something that is tastier than what's normally going on. That's what we need to be. Open up your spice rack at home. That's us. That's who we should be. Yummy. Variety of flavors. You know, when you go get a good meal and you're like, mmm, mmm. That's the way we should be. We should be tasty. The church needs to be tasty. That's what we should do. We should change the name again. Call it Tasty Church. <laughs> well, some of you are over the fact that we changed the name, so I want to tick you off again. Get you guys fired up. I like it when you guys are fired up. You know what? It's biblical to be tasty. Y'all know that? 
In Psalm 34, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. The church should be tasty. See, we're his representatives here on earth. We need to be beautiful sunsets. We need to be gorgeous art. We need to dance and we need to sing and we need to bring a beautiful, tastier way of life to our world. A gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. That's who we're supposed to be. So we're, it's Christmas time, right? And we're all getting ready to you know, say our little Ricky Bobby prayers to the baby Jesus and all that stuff. I get it, right? It's time to celebrate the baby Jesus. And that's cool, but you know what? Jesus was eternally awesome. Do you know that? He was awesome before he came down as a baby. He's awesome now. He was awesome as a newborn baby, for sure. He was so special that the adults, the wise men, actually worshipped a baby. That kind of seems weird, right? If I walked in the other room and someone was like bending down worshipping Jackson, I'd have a hard time with that. <laughs> they were worshipping the baby Jesus. However, and I'm, I'm, there's a point here, it also says in Luke 2.52 that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all people. The reason why I'm saying this is because, like Jesus, I believe that God fit this church here together at Revolution perfectly for his purposes, and I believe that we're an infant model of what we should be on a more mature level. I think we're already awesome. I really do. I think you guys are amazing right now. I think you're extremely gifted. I think you're very genuine. I think you're very kind, and I think you're extremely gifted and generous and all these things. You are. But much like Jesus was awesome as a child, he grew and got even better as he went. And I think that's the way we're supposed to be. We are, this, what I'm describing to you today, this culture, this gospel-centered culture creating community that brings beauty to the world, I think you already are that. But I think you are that as an, we are that as an infant, but we need to just grow and grow and grow and move forward and bigger and better for higher impact, just like Jesus did. Okay? Just like Jesus did. So, I want to close this way. And we'll go into detail in the weeks to come. But I want to, cl I want to close this way. I want you to dream of what could be. When you leave here tonight, I want to start the process of no longer just coming to church. I want you to start to believe of what could be. Of what God can do in and through Revolution Church. The sudden and momentous shift in the status quo, like what does that look like to you? I'm gonna share with you over the next three weeks what it looks like to me, but I'm not the only person here. We're a family. And so I want you to begin to dream about these things. I want you to dream about something that's bigger than you, bigger than your nine to five, bigger than your family, bigger than just your street, bigger than just your city. You know, there are some ministries in this world that are doing amazing work with them through the, through the Lord. I mean, he's working like crazy through these ministries. Do you think those people are any different than you? Do you think there's any yard guys in those churches? Yeah. Do you think there's any handymen? Do you think there's guys that do x-rays and physical therapy? and Maybe, maybe, there's, some, maybe there's some homeless people in there. Maybe there's people that are retired, that are on disability, and they, and they can't work at a nine to five anymore. Maybe there's people that are 88 years old that, don't, that aren't gonna be out there maybe knocking on doors or building people's houses for them. I think, I think that God knows what he's doing. I think he's placed us in this church together perfectly to do great work. We need to be a, a church that brings beauty to the world. And it's not about coming here to this building, pray, preach, sing, go home, and try to figure it out on your own. It just doesn't work. I'm gonna ask the gentleman, whoever's gonna come forward, please come forward, and we're gonna, they're gonna give out communion to you. And as they give it out to you, I'm gonna ask that you would hold on to it so we could take it as a family together. 
I'm going to pray right now. When I get done praying, they're going to give out those elements to you, and then we'll take it together as a family. Lord, I, uh, I want to thank you for, for this group of people. I want to thank you for the stirring that you're doing in people's hearts even now. I want to thank you, Lord, for the word of God that is powerful, and I thank you that we can live under its authority. I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is working in us all right now and causing us to dream of what could be. I thank you, Lord, for what's to come. I thank you, Lord, for, for over the years, the, the, the past four years, all the people that have come to this church, the people we've had the opportunity to meet and to spend time with and to live life with. I thank you for all the beauty that you've already had this church bring to our community, whether we were in Tavares when we moved to Leesburg and now here. It's been great. You're a good God, and this is a good church. And these are good people. And I thank you for all of them. I thank you for their willingness to be generous, their willingness to share openly all that they have. I thank you for their, their love for one another. I thank you for the love that you're stirring up inside of them for their community. And Lord, I pray that right now you would prepare our cities that we're in right here, Eustis, Mount Dora, Tavares, Leesburg, Grand Island, Lisbon, Tangerine, all the little nooks and crannies in this area. Lord, you have, you have brought an, an immense, an enormous amount of Christians to this area. And it's so that you can bring beauty to this world. So that this world, this community could see your beauty. And Lord, I pray that you would really begin to stir in us afresh right now. The reality of the gospel, the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of God. You'd help us to realize it. Help us to be a church that just doesn't get together to, to learn about you, Lord, but that we're a people that lives like you. Creative. Angles. Contrast. Variety. Tasty. That's who we're to be. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for a fresh start. As we enter the end of this year and begin a new year, 2015, Lord, we ask for your tremendous blessing on our church. Help us to be a church that brings beauty, your beauty, to this city. In Jesus' name, amen.